Okay, welcome everyone to the last uh, talk of this afternoon session. And we're going to have Elias Karitsis, who's going to tell us about holographic RG flows on curved manifolds and F functions. Thank you very much. And thanks to Johanna and her group for putting together this very, very good meeting. Um, the work I'm presenting here is based on papers that already appeared and also ongoing work with Francesco Nitti, Lukas Witkowski, and Joel Gosch in APC. It concerns the randomization group, and as you all know, the Wilsonian randomization group is controlled by first order equations, which is g dot equals to a beta function. And despite the many things we have learned over the years, there are many aspects of the renormalization group flows of quantum in four dimensions are fixed points or include other exotic possibilities like limit cycles or chaotic behavior. Of course, the answer to this question is also correlated with the potential symmetry of scale invariant theories, whether they're always conformally invariant or not. In two dimensions, we know that the answer to this question is yes. However, in four dimensions, despite a lot of attempts, especially recently, um, there are loopholes in the arguments of proving uh, this statement. In two dimensions, we have a Falk theorem, which says that if the strong version of the C theorem is correct, then this excludes limit cycles. However, this um, Falk theorem uh, has one important loophole, as it turned out, because people uh, manage to indicate that if beta functions, in fact, can have branch cuts, then one could both have a strong version of the C theorem and still potentially have limit cycles. However, if this ever occurs, it has to occur beyond perturbation theory. Let me also say a few general things about C functions and F functions. In two and four dimensions, we have established by now C theorems, and we have also associated C functions that interpolate properly between the ultraviolet and infrared conformal field theories along a renormalization group flow. In three dimension, also, there is an F theorem for CFTs, which uh, is associated with CFTs on, on a three sphere, and um, in terms of their renormalized partition functions. However, if you want now to use this as an, to construct an F function that would interpolate along uh, the flow, in fact, the, this renormalized partition function of the sphere, in fact, is known to fail. However, an alternative F function was proposed, um, in fact, initially motivated from holography, and this one was the appropriately renormalized entanglement entropy, which is associated with a two sphere in a three dimensional flat space and its complement. And in fact, for this one, there is a general proof indeed that in three dimensions, this is always monotonic. Now, my goal, at least in this line of thought, would be to, first of all, build an understanding of the general structure of holographic uh, renormalization, group, uh, renormalization group flows of qu holographic quantum field theories on flat space, then eventually extend this to holographic renormalization group flows for quantum field theories that now live on curved manifolds, for example, spheres, the sitter, and the sitter, etc., and then use this knowledge to revisit F functions in three and more dimensions. And what I'm going to present is a few highlights of this line of thought. Let me describe the setup in which I will be discussing things. For simplicity and clarity, I consider a bulk theory that contains only a metric and a single scalar. That's what we usually call einstein dilaton gravity. Uh, these fields are dual to the stress tensor and a scalar operator O of the dual quantum field theory. I will be using a two-derivative action that up to field redefinitions takes the standard form. I will assume that the potential is analytic everywhere except at the boundaries of field space that I put at phi equals plus or minus infinity. And I will be considering the ADS regime, which either I take V to be, let's say, always negative, or I'll be working in regions where V is negative. And I will be looking, first of all, for solutions uh, with d-dimensional Poincaré invariants, therefore an ansatz of this form, where the metric is characterized by scale factor and then 
phi is just a function of the holographic coordinate u, and this is expected to be dual to the ground state of uh, Lorentz invariant dual quantum field theories. Now, if you write the equations of motion that almost all of you must have done this at some point, uh, you realize that they have three integration constants, and in fact, the meaning of this integration constants uh, I will describe in a moment. But before doing that, I would like to rewrite the usual uh, Einstein equations in a first order form that already was shown by Costas uh, in the morning uh, by using this function that is known as superpotential, although there is no supersymmetry here or fake superpotential. And basically, you define it as a dot. Dot means the derivative with respect to the holographic coordinate. Then the equations tell you that phi dot has to be the derivative of this function with respect to phi. And then the third equation is telling you that this function w has to satisfy this equation. It's a first order nonlinear differential equation that relates it to the bulk scalar potential. So these three equations, of course, have the same number of integration constants, namely three. And in particular, there is a one parameter family of solutions to this equation. And each of these solutions, in fact, give you a family of solutions of the initial Einstein equations. So if you pick one solution here, then you can plug it in here, integrate these two equations with two integration constant, and you will find the solution. And these two integration constant here, generically, in fact, have the interpretation as the couplings of the dual quantum field theory. Uh, this one, it's basically the coupling constant that multiplies the operator O, and this one is a scale which tells you how you measure lengths in the ultraviolet. The third integration constant, which is hidden in the superpotential equation, in fact, can be shown to control the vacuum expectation value of the operator that's dual to phi. Therefore, one can say that the renormalization group flows are in one-to-one -one correspondence with a solution to this superpotential equation. And this is essentially the key equation I will be addressing in the rest of the talk. If you want to impose regularity, as we usually do in holographic theories, then typically it turns out that out of all the solutions of this equation, typically one leads to a regular solution. Sometimes there could be several. And in general, these are the ones that we consider. This is, of course, the statement that typically the value of the operator is fixed once you chose the coupling constant. Let me uh, give a, gen a few general properties. First of all, these equations, if you take W to minus W and you reverse the direction of the flow, this is a symmetry. And therefore, we will always choose the direction of the flow so that W is positive. Second, the superpotential equation can be written in this form. And because this is always non-negative, W is always bigger than this quantity. V is negative, so this is OK. I call it always B. And it says that there is always a lower bound for W, which I'm trying to find. And this lower bound is always given by the square root of minus V. You can prove immediately what we know as the holographic C theorem. If you track how W changes along the flow, then you do the derivative, the W d phi d phi du. d phi du is W prime, so this is W prime uh, square, and this is always non-negative. You can easily show also that the only singular flows are the flows that end up at the end of spill space, at phi plus or minus infinity. If a flow starts and ends at a finite point, then it's always regular. And moreover, you can always show that all regular solutions must start at an extremum of the potential and must end at an, another extremum of the potential. So these are general properties. Let me now show you a few exotic cases of flows. But before starting with the exotic one, let's look at the vanilla case. This is a W plot as a function of phi. This blue uh, line and blue region is, in fact, the function b. It's square root of minus v. Therefore, maxima of the potential are minima of b. Minima of the potential are maxima of b. Therefore, this maximum of v is an infrared fixed point. This is a uv fixed point, And this is a standard regular solution where you flow from a uv fixed point to the next one down the slope. 
However, there are more complicated cases, so let's see a few things. First of all, you can have bounces. A bounce is a place where W hits the boundary, but at a place where V is not extremal. In this case, you can see that W has, in fact, a non-analyticity. If you take two derivatives, it diverges. You always have two solutions that come to this point, and in fact, there are physical arguments that say that you have to glue them together, and the reason is because although W is not analytic at this point, the full solution, which is geometry plus phi, is absolutely regular. The only special thing that happens there is that phi dot equals to zero, and in fact, at phi dot equals to zero, the first order formalism breaks down. In fact, you calculate bulk curvature invariants, they're all regular. You calculate all fluctuation equations of the bulk fields, they're absolutely regular. However, if you calculate the beta function that was also mentioned by Costas, in that case, near the bounce, it has a branch cut. It vanishes as a square root. That means that the beta function is patchwise defined, and in fact, um, it vanishes at the bounce, but the flow does not stop there. Of course, this is non-perturbative behavior if we compare it with usually how we do first order flows in quantum field theory, and it is precisely this type of branch cut that was conjectured that can lead, in principle, to limit cycles without violating the A theorem. In fact, in this case, you can check, because the proof I gave you that W is always uh, increasing, and therefore 1 over W decreasing, is always true, including this case. However, in this particular case, one can show that although, in fact, you can go back and forth in a coupling constant, uh, you never can have a limit cycle. Let me show you a few uh, bizarre cases. This is, in fact, a flow where you flow from a minimum of the potential to another minimum. Now, we usually think of maxima as UV fixed points and minima as infrared fixed points, but sometimes, and this is for very special potentials, this is not a generic situation. In fact, a minimum can act as a UV fixed point via a special solution that doesn't have, in fact, any continuous parameters. And if you, in fact, this is an example of a case where this, in fact, is precisely such a flow and it's regular. It flows from a maximum of B to a maximum of B, which means minimum of the potential. And in fact, its interpretation is that this is a flow which has no coupling, but it's driven by a vacuum expectation value. But the reason this is a minimum is precisely because the vacuum expectation value is that of an operator which is irrelevant. And we know some cases in quantum field theory. The famous baryonic branch of n equal 1 super QCD is such a case as was discussed in the past. You can have regular multi-bounce flows. This is a numerical example, in fact, where you see that you have a regular flow because it starts from an extremum, it ends at an extremum, and then it bounces four times until it gets there. And then you can have cases where you have competition. Here you see two UV fixed points, which means two maxima of the potential, two minima of the potential, and then, when you solve the equations, you find there are two regular flows that start from this UV fixed point. One goes here, the other goes there. So this one, in fact, it jumps over these points. If you look at this one, you find there is a regular flow that goes there. But it is impossible, in fact, to find a regular flow going here. And the reason is that at each minimum of the potential, on each side, there is a unique regular flow that can appear there. Once this has gone there, no other flow can go there. This UV fixed point is an example of a theory which you can perturb with a positive, in this case, a negative coupling constant, but not with a positive coupling constant. The theory for a positive quantum constant does not exist. We know, of course, such examples of quantum field theories. Young Mills is such an example. Let me now come to quantum field theories on curved manifolds. Well, there are many reasons why one might be interested, and I will mention a few of them. There are more, in fact. Uh, first of all, compact manifolds like spheres are very important if you want to regularize massless or theories or conformal field theories. Um, quantum field theory in the sitter manifolds is interesting because, in fact, of the fact that we think that we live in a patch of the sitter, of almost the sitter, I should say. Uh, the induced effective gravitational action as a function of curvature can, so, can serve as a Hartle-Hawking wave function for three metrics for those who would like to do quantum cosmology. Um, and most importantly, curvature, although 
It is UV irrelevant, it is infrared relevant, and can change, importantly, the infrared structure of a given theory. And we will see examples of quantum phase transitions, in fact, that are driven by curvature. Moreover, it will turn out to be a useful tool in analyzing sphere partition functions and F-theorems. Let me now describe again the setup. It's a slight variation of what I was doing before. Now my ansatz is a scale factor for the metric, and now this is a maximally symmetric metric, but not a flat one. It may be a sphere, a de-sitter, on a de sitter Phi is again a function of the, um, of the holographic coordinate. And now my theory or my solution, if you wish, has two parameters or couplings. One is again the coupling constant associated to the operator O, which is dual to phi, but now I have also the curvature of my metric, of my ultraviolet metric. And I can combine them into a single dimensionless parameter that I will call, always call script R, which is this ratio between the two. If you take this R to zero, Essentially, it's like taking the curvature to zero. In this case, we expect to probe the full original theory from the ultraviolet to the infrared. But when R becomes non-zero and in particular becomes large, we know that this generates a big mass gap in the theory. And then as you push it to infinity, you probe more and more the ultraviolet of your original theory. So this indicates that if you vary this dimensionless parameter, you have, in fact, a dimensionless number that tracks the flow between the ultraviolet CFT and the infrared CFT. Let me again show how vanilla flows look like. So this was the original example where I have a maximum of the potential, minimum of B here, and the flat space flow, in fact, ends up here at the maximum. Now, if you crank up a little bit of curvature in your dual quantum field theory, this end point moves a little bit in this direction, and now, of course, W goes up to infinity. You crank up more, it moves more in this direction, and as script R goes to infinity, this moves back to the original ultraviolet fixed point, as we expect also from our intuition from standard quantum field theory. So this is the standard story. Let's see what happens now in complicated cases like the one I showed you before. So this was the case where I had two UV fixed points, two IR fixed points, and these are the zero um, curvature flows. Let's see what happens when you crank up a little bit of curvature. Now, the flow that started from here and ended here now splits into two solutions. One is just one that moved a little bit this way, as the usual case has, but the new one appears somewhere in the middle. This one did the standard thing. It just moved a little bit towards the ultraviolet fixed point. You crank up more and you solve eventually the full problem, numerically, of course, in this case, and you get this phase diagram. So let me explain the axis. This is script R. This controls, in a sense, this dimensionless curvature. And this is phi. And this is indicated, in fact, the end point of the flow. For each end point, there is a unique bulk solution. So this is the best way, in fact, to plot all possible solutions. So, for example, if you look at r equals zero, you have r equals zero, in fact, corresponds to the infrared fixed points. You have this case, and you have this case, and this, in fact, is weird, so forget it for the moment. But then when you crank up a little bit of curvature, you see you have one solution here, and you have two solutions here. I forgot to say that all of these solutions don't go to the same ultraviolet fixed point. I have to separate them into which one goes to UV1 and which one goes to UV2. In fact, this blue, oops, this blue part and this blue part, in fact, are all the flows that go up to UV1. So let me discuss them first. So you go to small curvature, you have one solution here, and you have two solutions here. That's what I showed you in the previous diagram. And then you continue moving up. This solution, of course, exists all the way to infinite curvature, but this one stops existing after a while. And since I told you, or in fact, I forgot to tell you, that at zero curvature, this solution that went farther is in fact the one that is thermodynamically, or if you wish, in terms of free energy, dominant. In the beginning, you are here, but at some point, in fact, there is a phase transition where you jump to this branch. This is a quantum phase transition because there is no temperature. 
and then eventually, of course, you go up to infinity. So this is the structure, if you wish, of the flows that are associated to this uh, ultraviolet fixed point. The situation here is a little bit more complicated, and there are three regions. Now, all of these flows end up at UV2 in the ultraviolet. However, it is this and this that end up with the same coupling, which means negative, as you, we had at zero curvature, whereas here are flows where you start flowing with a positive coupling. Remember that in this region, there was no solution if you started flowing in this direction. And indeed, that's what you see here. For example, if you flow on the, on, the, on, the, on the left, you have now two solutions at finite curvature, and this one always wins, and they go up all the way to infinity. But if you start flowing on the right, here and up to this point, there is no solution, but solutions appear, in fact, if you have enough curvature. So this regime is the example of a theory that doesn't exist at zero curvature, but exists at finite curvature. Do we know simple examples like this? And the answer is uh, yes. In fact, we have a theory where phi zero, which is the source or the coupling, um, is positive and when r is smaller than some number, the radius does not exist, but it exists above. And in fact, the example is this, single scalar with a potential, which is a phi four potential. Now I wrote it in a way that with lambda positive, of course this doesn't exist because the potential is completely unstable. Lambda ne negative it exists, is the standard lambda phi four. But now turn on curvature. This is the conformal coupling, and it's obvious that if R square becomes uh, small enough, this generates a new minimum, and now the theory is perturbatively stable. So that's similar to what we are seeing here. Now there are two points that require uh, special attention. It's this one and this one. In this point, you see that the curvature goes to infinity, but this is not a UV fixed point as we would have expected to have in this case. This is in fact a normal case where indeed R goes to infinity. In this case, this goes to infinity and there is another point that's a little bit more strange that I will describe in a moment. So let's look at this, what it means. In fact, in this case, this is associated in fact to a distinct branch of the theory. And if you sit at this point, in fact, what happens is that the source vanishes. This is why R, in fact, goes to infinity. And you, although you kept, for example, the curvature finite, and in fact, the single solution that exists at this point corresponds to one parameter family of theories, or saddle points, if you wish, which have zero coupling, but a non-trivial relevant VEV, which is given by a fixed number that, in principle, you can calculate, times the appropriate power of the curvature. So what you see here is an example of this UV CFT that has, in fact, two vacua without, per, this without any perturbation, by not perturbing it at all. It has the usual ADS vacuum, which is sliced by, by sphere, and it also has a non-trivial vacuum, which has a non-zero expectation value. Let me now come to this point. Now, this point is a little bit more strange because it's in between two regimes where you have flows that correspond to this theory and flows that correspond to this theory. So let's see what happens here. In fact, what happens here is that suppose you look at flows and you start approaching this point on this side. This is a flow that starts somewhere here, comes down close to this uh, infrared fixed point, and then it continues and it comes here. If you eventually reach phi exclamation mark here, in fact, this line will come and eventually pass from this infrared fixed point, and then it will continue here. Now, let's look at what happens if you approach it from this side. Now, from this side, you have a flow that comes near this infrared fixed point, turns around, and comes to this UV fixed point. And if you approach now phi exclamation mark from this side, eventually this flow comes hits here, and then eventually goes here. However, if you think of what this phi exclamation mark describes, um, I'm sorry. Um, in fact, it describes 
the standard uh, flows that we had for the flat case, from here to here and from here to here, and this very bizarre flow. And this very bizarre flow, in fact, has the following interpretation. In fact, this particular point cannot be reached from either UV1 or UV2. It can be reached only by the minimum, which is IR1. And the flow from the minimum has zero source, and a VEV that is given again by a similar formula, a number times the appropriate power of the curvature. For this flow, this infrared point, which I call it infrared because it used to be infrared, this is a minimum of the potential, acts now as a UV fixed point, that is there is an ADS boundary there, and in fact you can explain why R goes to zero, because delta minus for an irrelevant operator in fact is negative. So this is a one parameter family of saddle points with different curvature where the theory is driven by the web on irrelevant operator, but now you are at finite curvature, and in fact this Solutions are very interesting because they may play a role in Coleman de Lucia story. Let me now come to the free energy and the entanglement entropy. If you do a direct computation, in fact, you find that the on-shell free energy in the case of curved flows has the following structure. It has the usual factors in front. This is the factor that you find also in the flat case, and here it is the volume times the superpotential W. This is standard. You have, on the other hand, because of the curvature, a new term. And this term is given by an integral over some powers of the scale factor. Now, if you look at the case where R is positive, this, at the same time, of course, describes both the sphere and the sitter space. The question is, how do you renormalize? We know that from a long time. In fact, you have to subtract all the divergences that appear in the superpotential, and then you have a few divergences that exist in this term, starting with the Einstein term. The Einstein term is in here. And in fact, in three dimensions that will eventually specialize to, you have several divergences that you subtract here, and you have only one divergence here, which is the normalization um, uh, of the Einstein term. And this will introduce, eventually, the renormalized action scheme dependence. On the other hand, the renormalized free energy, now you can take the cutoff to infinity, and it depends only on a single dimensionless parameter, and this is R. Now, let me consider the entanglement entropy of a quantum field theory in a de Sitter space, and if you describe a d-dimensional de Sitter space as a d-1 sphere that starts large, goes to minimum size, and goes back to infinity again, and then you look at the sphere at the minimum size, you split it into hemispheres, and you compute the entanglement entropy between these two, using Ryu Takagenaiki, for example, you get a formula that was already computed, which is given here. Now, the interest of this formula, it is precisely that it is this factor that appears in the free energy. So this part of the free energy is exactly the, the Sitter entanglement entropy. It is known, it is known that uh, for a, a conformal uh, field theory, this particular entanglement entropy using conformal transformations can be mapped into the standard conformal field theory of a sphere inside flat space, but not for the theories we consider here because uh, they are uh, not conformal. It is known that it is the, thermal, the same as the thermal entropy of the static parts in the sitter, and it is also true that if you take this particular entanglement entropy and you try Liu Meze, it doesn't work because it's still ultraviolet divergence. So the question is, in 3D, can we define an F function from the free energy on S3? So let me quickly go through that. You have to renormalize. Let me remind you how the free energy depends on the cutoff and the curvature. This is where the cutoff appears, and these are the only two ultraviolet divergences if the dimension of your operator is not close to 3. And then you have these factors of the curvature. This is, sorry. This is the volume, essentially, because the R is the curvature, not the radius. But this expansion here defines two functions of R, this one and this one. And in fact, this is related to the curvature-dependent expectation value of phi. This is related to some correlation function in the stress tensor, and the cutoff is defined in the standard way. Now, to renormalize, you have to subtract the divergences, and after you subtract and you take the cutoff to infinity, your result depends on these two functions, and two scheme-dependent coefficients, which come in with your normalization. If you do the same for the entanglement entropy, 
In fact, it is essentially this part, and you get a similar formula, and here you have a single uh, scheme-dependent coefficient. Now, I would like to try to define f functions. I will use r as an interpolating variable between the infrared, which means r equals 0, to the ultraviolet, which means r equals infinity. f must be uv and infrared finite, and an f function must satisfy that it takes in the uh, ultraviolet and in the infrared the appropriate values at the fixed points, and then that it is um, monotonic. We have four proposals, in fact, which are based on free energy. This is the definition of derivatives, similar to the ones used by Liu M and J. In one case, you act in the unnormalized free energy with these two coefficients. In this case, with, you, with these two uh, differential operators. Here, you act with differential operators, but also you choose one of the uh, scheme-dependent parameters in a specific way. The specific way is given here, and it's defined uniquely. So you have these four different ways, and these four different ways, all they do, in fact, is they subtract the ultraviolet and the infrared divergences in four different ways. There is two more that you can construct by using the entanglement entropy, and they are written here. And it's interesting that these two, in fact, are related with two that I defined already via the free energy. Now, you can check that these four asymptote properly to the ultraviolet and the infrared limits. You can check that these four are monotonic in the many numerical holographic examples we analyzed with delta bigger than 3 over 2. In fact, in order for this to work properly, when delta is smaller than 3 over 2, you should replace these functions with the Lazan transforms. And in fact, it is precisely this prescription that makes these, the proposals in the previous slide make them work for three theories. And as you probably remember, uh, the reason that the usual F theorem, um, F, um, F function as the sphere partition function fails is because of the free massive boson. However, we have no general proof of monotonicity. Let me finish. Um, I argued that exotic holographic flows can appear for other generic potentials. The black holes which is associated with them have been analyzed, and you can see similar phenomena like the ones I mentioned at finite curvature. Bouncing flow seems to be intermediate between regular monotonic flows and limit cycles. Uh, however, it is an interesting question to what extent they are an artifact of the large N expansion. We don't know. One might try to prove monotonicity of the four F functions that I wrote down, and also to extend them to five dimensions. We have also another proposal for an F function, but this is a function of the cutoff rather than the curvature, so it's defined for flat space, but it's not fully developed yet. And I should say that our analysis and the unusual curved solutions we find seem to have a radical impact on the stability of ADS minima due to the Coleman de Lucia decay processes. Thank you. Some questions? Julian. Uh, it is an assumption that instantons that lead to the decay of Coleman de Lucia uh, decay. Um, let's say from ADS to ADS, genetically exist if they satisfy a kind of BPS bound, and this is based on the thin wall approximation. We do believe that this is not true, that genetically that doesn't exist, and you need very special such solutions like the weird one I showed you before. But this is our very naive expectation for the moment. One more at the back. So you treated the renormalization group flows with one scalar, no? And uh, you, you mentioned the possibility of cycles and strange behavior like chaos. So in dynamical systems, you have these things when the phase space is uh, of bigger dimensionality, no? Have you tried to have more uh, couplings to have this possibility? Yes, uh, indeed, the multi 
field case has been solved. That is, this assumes, of course, uh, let's say d plus one holographic theory with many scalar fields. And in that case, you can do the analysis and it turns out that it is uh, similar. Uh, and you can indeed prove the same thing. There is an important uh, caveat in this statement. In order to show this, you have to take into account that whenever you have rotational symmetries in your scalar fields, they're always gauged in string theory. Hmm. And this is important, otherwise you would have uh, such limit cycles. In fact, such limit cycles were found by Steryu um, uh, and collaborators. In fact, in field theory, in the beginning, they thought they found indeed limit cycles, but then they realized that these are defined away by global symmetries. The global symmetries are gauged here, and in fact, these limit cycle solutions, in fact, are gauge artifacts. Uh, there is another caveat, on the other hand, that you could have uh, holographic theories where you have more than one holographic directions if you have additional adjoints, and there the story is still unexplored. Uh, already, um, Jerome had pointed out to me that there is at least some claim in the literature that there might be a limit cycle um, case in, in, in such a solution. Um, so this case, in fact, needs further investigation. But once the theory can be written as a D plus one theory with multi fields, I think the case is settled. Okay. Okay, I think we need to wrap things up. Um, so before thanking Elias again,